land that has seen not one, but many civilizations flourish and decay. Where even today the pattern of an ancient life is scarcely broken. Here in Nigeria is the location of our story. Here in the country of the Ebels. This is territory into which European civilization has been poured with urgent haste. And the Ebos have not been slow to see its value. Here then is the modern Africa, arming itself with knowledge and discipline, seeking new ways to illuminate its own world and its problems. learning the skills and practices of a mechanized age. A new pattern is emerging, as yet confused and uncertain. A new Africa is on the march, hungry for knowledge and power, engrossed in its own material progress. New influences are destroying the ancient gods and with them the old traditions and beliefs. Something must replace them, for these people are not seeking just a new way of life, but a better one. And that is what our missionaries offer them, a better way of life, Christianity. To Africa they have brought not merely the knowledge, not merely the sciences and techniques of Europe, for its Christian tradition and culture. Into the darkness and confusion of this changing land, with its pagan belief and unbelief, they have borne a light, the true light that enlighteneth every man that cometh into this world. They have given these people a new purpose in life and a new destiny a small band of Irish missionaries, men and women, who wage the unending battle against the powers of darkness. What manner of men and women are they? Let us return to Ireland and see. The Maynooth mission to China marked the revival of the Irish missionary movement. Missionary societies and congregations throughout the country received a fresh impetus. It seemed as though the fervor of the Irish people was suddenly released after centuries of repression. It was fitting that the National Seminary should have given the lead to this movement that saw the birth of so many new congregations. Among them, the missionary sisters of Our Lady of the Holy Rosary, Kilachandra County Cavan. Since its foundation in 1924, many young women have come here, have passed through this room, and now work as missionaries abroad. Irish girls like these have been heroic in realizing the ideals of their founder, Bishop Joseph Shanahan of the Holy Ghost Fathers, a truly great Irish missionary. After 20 years among the pagans of southern Nigeria, he saw that real progress was impossible without a congregation of missionary sisters who would work among the native women and girls to teach them the ideals of Christian womanhood. In 
1922, he was joined in Nigeria by six lay apostles, five Irish girls and one American. Later, two of these girls formed the nucleus of the Holy Rosary Sisters. A third founded the Medical Missionaries of Mary. And that's how it all began in 1924. As these girls listen, their enthusiasm grows. This surely is the congregation for them. They are interviewed by Mother General, who suggests that they consider carefully the step they wish to take. So off they go to consider their decision in the new and to ponder over the things they have learned here today. Certainly these girls seem confident and happy in their choice. But a missionary career is not one to be lightly undertaken. Constancy must go with enthusiasm. If their purpose holds, these girls will soon return. Kilishandra is a little world in itself, with its own palm, its dairy and poultry, its orchards and gardens. Much of the work is done by the sisters themselves. Sometimes the new arrivals find themselves in very unfamiliar surroundings. For instance, Sister Ender, who used to be a secretary, is sent to help on the poultry farm. Sister Angela finds herself on the kitchen staff. The kitchen and the vegetable garden are now her particular world. Not as unfamiliar as Sister Ender's poultry farm, perhaps, but full of novelties just the same. But of course, she is not left to her own devices. Every postulant, no matter what her task is, works under the guidance of an experienced sister. Many sisters qualify in domestic science so that they may help in pagan lands to further the ideas of the Christian family and home. And so the work goes on. Everybody's busy and everyone is happy. Each has an appointed task, and as the time passes, each postulant spends a little while at these different activities. Recreation is a necessary part of community life. Gardening is a favorite form of relaxation and gives the sisters plenty of scope for their ability and enthusiasm. But these white-robed novices prefer less energetic pastimes. They like the shady arbor where they do a little embroidery and a great deal of chattering. But the most important part of the newcomer's life is her spiritual formation she must learn to understand the theory which underlies the religious state. The wisdom of a lifetime spent in God's service is there to enlighten, advise, and encourage her. But above all, there is prayer to guide and direct her, for her chief weapons must always be spiritual ones. After the Mass, it is from the Divine Office and the Rosary that the Kilishandra sister receives light strength, and solace. Six months pass. The postulants have made their decision. Thank you. 
Today, they will be received into the congregation. Come, bride of Christ, receive the crown which the Lord has prepared for thee from eternity. My children, what do you desire? The mercy of God, the privilege of being clothed with the holy habit of religion and the favor of being admitted as a novice into the congregation of Our Lady of the Holy Rosary. The crucifix, the rosary, the habit which each will receive are solemnly blessed. O daughter, and see and incline thine ear, and forget thy people and thy father's house. And the king shall desire thy comeliness, because he is the Lord thy God. He will enlighten thine eyes, that they may never sleep in death, lest thine enemy at any time say, I have prevailed against her. in the holy habit of religion, prostrate at the foot of the altar, they surrender themselves to their Lord and Master. They have taken the white veil of the novice. Before them lie two years of seclusion and further spiritual formation. They are withdrawn, as far as possible, from all harmful influences. Henceforward, they belong not to themselves, but to God. study of the humanities and sciences is excluded, but a novice may use whatever knowledge she has already acquired. Thus, Sister Angela, who is a chemist, helps in the infirmary compounding medicines. The novices learn many useful and often profitable arts and crafts, like leather work, toy making, and weaving. Such activities bring rich experience which will later be used to the full on the mission field. Vestment making is a traditional activity in most convents. Vestments and altar linen for all parts of the country are made at Gilishandra. The work reminds us of the labors of the ancient Irish monks illuminating their manuscripts. The same lovely designs, the same painstaking care, the same meticulous attention to detail. It takes patience and skill and more patience. But the novice's life is mainly a life of prayer and spiritual exercises. The daily recital of the divine office is now her privilege and her duty. a sister sets about preparing for her active missionary life. At her profession, she takes the triple vow of obedience, poverty, and chastity, and changes the white veil of the novice 
for the black one of the professed sister. Many of these sisters train as nurses, some become chemists, a number qualify as dentists and doctors. Another group qualifies in the arts and sciences. These are the teachers on whose work the whole missionary effort depends. Their future schools may be mud cabins or colleges. Their pupils may be infants or undergraduates. They must cater for everyone. According as they qualify, the sisters set off for the missions. The demand for sisters is unceasing, and for supplies also. There is little of the customary sadness about their farewells. This is the moment they have looked forward to for which they have striven and prayed. Invoking a blessing for their work, they begin the long journey into exile. Behind them are their people and their father's house. Before them, the glorious adventure. in Africa, blend of enchantments and secrets, fabulously improbable and contradictory, fascinating and unendurable, a battlefield of religions and cultures. Africa with its cities and harbors, its airports and railways and arterial roads, its schools and hospitals its European culture and sophistication. But behind all this, there is another Africa of deadly creeks and swamps, infested forests, trackless bush, an Africa oppressed by pagan tradition and the cult of the Juju. That was the Africa they came to conquer more than 25 years ago. A handful of women with a few cases of books and medical supplies. That was how the world saw them. And yet, they have conquered. pioneers have today become an army. They have succored the spiritually destitute and downtrodden women of Nigeria and inspired them with their own ideals. 
they have shattered a tradition that seemed to question the very humanity of woman. They have penetrated inland from these coasts to Onitsha, Ihala, Emakuku, Okigwe, Adazi, Inugu, and Sokka. Emakuku, Okigwe, Adazi, Inugu, and Sokka, as far as their numbers would allow, relying simply on the divine promise. Behold, I am with you all days. Towards Christianity. To these people come Sister Patricia and Sister Columba. Much of the journey must be done on foot. Along bush paths and forest track, beneath the scorching heat of a tropical sun. Their plan of campaign is to find the local chief and get his permission for their work. The town consists of thousands of small houses. They are nearly all constructed of mud, with roofs of either dry grass or palm mats. Contaminated water. This is one of the water supplies for this town. Water collected in these pots during the wet season becomes stagnant, and later spreads disease and death among the people. It is not easy to find one's way in an African town. Happily, the sisters meet a friendly youngster. Yes, he knows where the chief's house is. Certainly, he will conduct them there. Well, here we are at last. The chief's house is built in concrete, a good deal more elaborate than his neighbor's dwellings. But its purpose is essentially the same, a place to sleep and shelter from the rain. Cooking, eating, and all social functions take place outside. The sisters are received outside under a mango tree. Though they are women and strangers to these people, he greets them with the innate courtesy of the Igbo. The Igbos are passionately devoted to their children. In fact, the children are the best ambassadors the missionaries have in their dealings with them. The chief, Nwasu, has several wives and many children. But he is just as attached to little Ahudie as to any of the others. He is delighted by the attentions which the sisters pay to her but he is much too polite to inquire the nature of their business without first sharing the kola nut with them. The kola nut is a traditional sign of welcome and goodwill, not unlike the sharing of salt among Arabs. The chief breaks the nut and takes a piece himself and passes the remainder to his guests. It is hard and has a bitter taste like quinine, but the sisters regard it as an encouraging sign. There are others who have no welcome for the sisters, especially Anakwe the Dibia, the local witch doctor. He is the very incarnation of all the forces they are here to conquer. Meanwhile, the sisters explain their business to the chief. They tell him about the schools and hospitals they have set up in other towns. Surely he realizes it is good to have schools. Surely he doesn't want his children to remain more ignorant and more backward than those of neighboring towns. The chief agrees rather cautiously. He knows quite well how sound these arguments are, but he knows too the force of pagan tradition and his distrust of innovation. But, Sister Patricia says, we shall bring you more than schools. We shall teach you to cure your sick. We have many medicines which can help you to wipe out many of the diseases which ravage your people. This is exactly what Anakwe fears. Already he must make plans to thwart these people. Sister Patricia tells Nwasu about the water pots that they have passed in the compound and the danger of drinking dirty water that breeds the sickness which weakens his people. 
Nwasu would like to see some of these medicines, although he does not understand them. He would like to keep this one for himself. But Sister Patricia doesn't want him to poison himself through an excess of zeal, so she explains to him how it is to be used. He thanks them gravely for their visit and explains that he would like to think this business over and discuss it with the headmen of the town before giving a decision. And the sisters leave him well satisfied that he is on their side and will do his best to win over the headmen. the chief calls together the headmen of the town to discuss the sisters' proposition. Opinion differs widely on the matter. For the most part, they are the honest opinions of responsible men. But Anakwe has lost no time in stirring up opposition. Why let these strangers into our town? They will teach our children new ways, and then they will no longer respect their elders. They will forsake the old traditions of our people, and we shall no longer have any control over them. I have heard of these schools, I have met people like myself who can read and write and have fine jobs in the government. Why shouldn't our people get the same chance? I am an old man. I know nothing about schools or hospitals. But I think maybe it is good for our children to have them. And so the argument goes on. Nwasu, still treasuring Sister Patricia's medicine, listens to them all. The majority, he feels, are in favor of admitting the sisters. Even Anakwe, though he does his best with threats and prophecies of disaster, cannot shake their conviction that they are taking the right course. The spirits will be angry, he cries. They will visit the people with all manner of fearful punishments if they allow the sisters to come here with their new ways and strange beliefs. But the headmen are skeptical. Other towns have accepted the sisters, and nothing has happened to them. So Nwasu, with the majority behind him, gives his decision. The sisters shall be admitted. Next day, the townspeople begin to build their first school. Like most buildings here, it is made of mud, which in this climate dries out almost as hard as concrete. Work of poles supports the roof, which is thatched with dried grass. Practically all the materials required for building are found on the spot. So the work goes forward apace under the supervision of Opara, the chief's eldest son. There is great excitement and enthusiasm everywhere. These people are positively greedy for knowledge, and the prospect of any of their number learning book, as they call education, is one that appeals to them all. Up she goes. How's that for prefabrication? But Sister Columba is not one to waste time. Without waiting for the school to be finished, she assembles as many of the townspeople as she can and holds her first class in the open. They are nearly all women and children who have come to listen to her. Among them is the chief's daughter, Ada. So already, two of the chief's household are interesting themselves in this new project, which Sister Columba now explains to them. Even some of the men who have come to watch these proceedings from a safe distance seem interested. But when Sister Columba beckons them to join the class, they grow confused. It would not be right for them to do so, they explain, because it would not be in accordance with a man's dignity to allow himself to be taught by a woman. And after all, the sister is a woman. No, it would not be right. But if the father held a class, that would be different. Well, that's just like men. However, she knows the father will look after them. The women and girls are the sister's first concern. But when Sister Patricia holds a dispensary, she has no trouble in collecting a crowd. Men, women and children throng about her to sample this strange new medicine. They turn up with all manner of pains and aches, some real, some imaginary, some trivial, some so serious 
but only the most modern hospital treatment can help them. But Sister Patricia, with the help of a trained nurse from the Mission Hospital, arranges them in an orderly queue and does her best for all of them. But many of these people need more extensive treatment than she can give them at a table under a tree. She must have a building of some sort for them where they can be nursed and properly looked after, and especially for the mothers and children. But Anacre is still a power in this place, and he continues to fly his ancient trade among the more superstitious and fearful of his neighbors. The mere presence of the sisters in this town is not enough to discredit him in the eyes of the people, or to divest him of the awesome powers which are traditionally his. Having examined his patient, he explains at great length the nature of her sickness, his own skill in the matter, and the special nature of his cure. But the unfortunate woman seems too ill to care, even when he applies the sacred stone to her forehead and chest and assures her of a speedy recovery. Don't worry, she'll be all right. Of course, a sacrifice will have to be made to the spirits. In this case, perhaps a goat will be a satisfactory offering. In spite of the crowds with which she has to deal, Sister Patricia has suspected that many sick people were not being brought to her dispensary. She knows well how fearful many of them are of Anacre. This woman is gravely ill. Why hasn't she been brought to the dispensary? Anacre dismisses the suggestion. He is polite, but firm. The woman is his patient. He will cure her by his own methods. How can you cure her by your methods? She needs medicine, the sort of medicine I can give her. You know you can't cure her with a juju stone or by offering a sacrifice. The sister is mistaken. This woman will be cured. We have our own medicines and our own spirits. It is fruitless to argue. Anacre is adamant. The husband is too terrified to interfere. His wife is too ill. Even if either of them would listen to her. Their young son drags an unwilling goat to his father, who in turn delivers it to Anacre, who gives it back to the boy and bids him lead it to the place of sacrifice. What can Sister Patricia do? This woman needs skillful nursing and proper medical attention. She must have a building for cases like these where she can get them away from Anacre. Meanwhile, in the newly finished school, Sister Columba organizes her classes. Here they are, her first pupils. The first children in this town to learn book, and very seriously, they take it too. But taken all round, they rather like it. Especially this part. Pretty soon, work starts on Sister Patricia's clinic, under the supervision of a Holy Ghost father with long building experience. For African missionaries must be their own architects, builders, and engineers. The clinic is a more ambitious affair than the school. The school need be little more than a shelter for use by the pupils during the day. But the clinic must be suitable for housing sick people by night as well as by day, in both the dry and the wet season. So the clinic is constructed of concrete blocks and roofed with zinc or aluminium. Time passes and a day comes when the first converts in this town make the long trek to the nearest church to receive baptism. For as yet they have no church of their own. Many of the men and women here today have been won over by their own children, Sister Columbus pupils, who carried her teaching from the school into their own homes. But the pearl of the old life is still strong, especially for the older people. Chief Mosso is not here today, and there are many others like him, for whom Christianity is still too new and difficult. But Opara is here. Today, he will take the name Clement. And so is Ada. But Nwasso, like many pagans, has forbidden his daughter to become a Christian. He has his own plans for her. Soon the clinic is
is completed and in operation. Sister Patricia is kept busy, but she is happy, for she knows the people have accepted her and that they trust her. More and more women are coming to her now for advice and treatment for themselves and their babies. Her patients are happy too. Even these two little orphans who have found a new home here. But tragedy comes here too. Twins are held to be abominable to the spirit and are therefore believed to be a curse. These newborn babies and their unfortunate mother were thrown out into the bush to die. Clement explains how he and his companions rescued them and brought them here. Perhaps the sister can save them. The woman is more dead than alive. And one of the babies seems to be on the point of death. So Sister Patricia hastens to baptize it. just in time, too. For almost immediately afterwards, the child is dead. There is little hope of saving the woman's life either. She has been too weakened by her ordeal. Her misfortunes have been too much for her. She doesn't want to live. The men wait. Clemens looks for some hopeful news from the nurse, but she has none to give him. Though Sister Patricia cannot save this poor creature's life, she can help prepare her to die. All her anxieties are now for the spiritual welfare of this woman. She listens to the sister. She wishes to be baptized. The men still wait. Sister Patricia brings them the news. But their grief is lessened by the fact that she died a Christian. They know her soul is safe with God. And the second twin, another of Sister Patricia's orphans. Months slip by and the years. The school is flourishing. The children are growing up. Ada is almost a young woman now. They have attended the school. They have learned book, as Sister Columba promised they would. And today they are taking the entrance examination for the Holy Rosary Sisters Secondary School. Girls who a few short years ago were ignorant, untaught little children. Sister Columba has worked hard with them. This day will show just how hard and how successfully. There is great excitement when the results come out. Ada is fairly high on the list, but her friend Lucy seems to have difficulty finding her name. Ah, here we are. Last. But what of it? It doesn't worry Lucy anyway. She doesn't care what place she got as long as she passed. Now a new phase begins for these girls. A new sort of life is beginning for them. They are the first girls from their town to go to a boarding school. All their schoolmates turn out to see them off. 
they have already taken farewell of their families. But they know that this is no holiday they are going on. They will have to work hard in their new school, harder even than they worked with Sister Kalanda. But all that they are aware of today is the thrill and excitement of a new adventure. while it is still cool. Well now, what's this? Why, it's our old friend Lucy. The school is as modern as any in Europe. The same subjects are taught here, and at the end of their course, the pupils take examinations for entrance to the universities, just as they do in these countries. But most of these girls will eventually marry. They are the future housewives and mothers of Africa, so their education has its practical side as well. It was to rescue these girls, to liberate them from an oppressive tradition, to inspire them with the new ideals, that the Holy Rosary Sisters came to this country to establish the ideal of the Christian family among them. And that means raising their standards in the physical and material sphere as well as in the spiritual one. They do this by developing what is best in the traditions of these people and by gradually introducing more gracious ways of living from their own civilization and culture. All the time they are receiving new impressions and ideas and learning new facts, not only in the classroom, but in all the varied activities of the school. They love physical training and games of all kinds and play them with enthusiasm and verve. In their leisure time, they're encouraged to engage in some form of recreation, to read or write or knit or sew or embroider. Many of the senior girls become legionaries and the school has its own presidium. Every evening as the sun goes down, the bell sounds for night prayers. Into the oratory they go to give thanks to God and to honor her under whose protection they have placed themselves, Our Lady of the Rosary. So the time goes by till the day comes when they have finished their course here. They have worked hard, the examinations are over and the successful candidates are gathered to receive their certificates. And, wonderful to relate, Lucy is one of them. For most of these girls, the future has been decided. Some will return to their towns to marry and settle down. The others will go on to study for a career, mostly as teachers and nurses. Ada intends to train as a teacher. And as she gives her her certificate, Sister Bridget wishes her all success. By one they go up to receive the coveted pieces of parchment. Even Lucy gets one. Now she can begin to realize her ambitions, to be a nurse. And so their school days come to an end with general rejoicings and plans for the next stage of their careers. Ada and Lucy will remain in this mission center where the sisters have both a training college for teachers and a hospital, as well as the secondary school. Ever since the first group of Holy Rosary sisters came to Africa, they have trained Africans as teachers and nurses. When the first Catholic hospital was opened at Emikuku, seven Africans went on probation. Today, the number of nurses has risen to over 200. Lucy is the Lewish company with her happy-go-lucky disposition. She has already made friends with all her colleagues, including John, the dispenser, to whom she has been sent by the sister in charge to collect dressings. But poor Lucy is so interested in everything around her that she sometimes forgets what she has been told. No bandage. Well, back you go, my girl, and hurry.
bandage. One like this, or this, or maybe this one. John can be a maddening tease when he likes. Meanwhile, back in the ward, Sister prepares her patient. What on earth is keeping that girl? It doesn't take that long to get a simple thing like a bandage. Well, the only thing to do is to go and find her. Not a sign of her. Lucy, what's the meaning of this? And you, John, you ought to know better. Poor Lucy. It's not all her fault, but she is rather giddy. If she's going to make a good nurse, she'll have to take things somewhat more seriously. All right, put the bandage down on the tray and pay attention. And so the demonstration proceeds, and a temporarily subdued Lucy concentrates all her attention on the technique of dressing leg ulcers. Ada, in the meantime, has begun her studies in the training college nearby. It was indeed an event in the history of Nigeria when women left their burden bearing and their market booths to follow the teaching profession. For these same women have proved to be the leaven in a titanic mass of paganism. It is largely due to the cooperation of African girl teachers like these that the work of the Holy Rosary Sisters has made such remarkable progress in Nigeria. During the dry season, much of the work of the schools and colleges is done in the open air. And here comes Lucy again, on her way to the hospital. Go away, silly. Can't you see I am working? Working? Do you call that working? You should come down to the hospital sometime, and you will find out what work is like. Work? You'd better go down there right now, or you'll be in trouble again. Next day, the student teachers carry their boards across to the practicing school to do their practical teaching. Each of them works under the guidance of a qualified teacher, while two sisters from the training college visit each of them in turn to appraise their teaching and examine their notes. Today is a holiday. Everybody who can be spared has the day off. And most of them, like Lucy, are preparing to go to a dance festival which is being held in the neighborhood. John is free today too. John and Lucy have now become fast friends. But Lucy has not abandoned her old friend, Ada, so they go together. dancers are somewhat reminiscent of ballet, but here the dancers are all men. Each dance tells a story in a formal, conventional fashion, and there is keen rivalry between the competing troops. There is keen criticism by the spectators, too. Every one of them is a shrewd judge of technique from the greybeards in the stalls to the youngsters in the gallery. Accidents will happen, even on a public holiday. This man has fallen from a palm tree, a common enough for Kearns out here. He is looking to be alive at all. The sister doctor makes a swift examination. 
couple of ribs broken here. One of them seems to have pierced his lung. Nothing for it but an immediate operation. But most of her nurses are away today. And so is John. This is the worst possible day for an emergency operation. News of the crisis spreads swiftly. And as soon as John hears of it, he returns with all haste to the hospital. And Lucy, the irresponsible Lucy of all people, comes with him. A few words from the sister doctor, and they know what is required of them. this hospital and the doctors and nurses of the Holy Rosary Sisters, this man would surely die. Twenty years ago, his injuries would have been fatal. Today, the skill of this sister surgeon would save his life. But he is lucky. He came to grief in this area. But there are millions of people in Africa without even a nurse to help them. Well, that's that. The operation is over. He's as good as new again. He can be removed to the ward now, but he will still require skillful nursing. Lucy is assigned to the case, for Lucy is at last learning the meaning of service and responsibility. By this time, Ada has become a qualified teacher. Now, as an independent woman, she may defy her father's prohibition and become a Christian. She may receive the sacrament of baptism for which he has waited so patiently and so long. Therese, what dost thou ask as the Church of God? Faith. What does faith offer thee? Life of a lot. If then thou desire to enter into life, keep the commandments. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. Actibisal sapiensi propitiatius et tibi in vitam eternum. Amen. In gradery and templum dei ut habeas partum cum Christo in vitam eternum. Amen. Dost thou renounce Satan? I do renounce him. And all his works? I do renounce him. And all his pumps, I do enough. Ego te linear ulio salutis in Christo Jesu Domino Nostro ut habeas vitam eternum. Amen. Be baptized. I will. Ego te baptizo in nomine Patris et Fidi et Spiritus Sancti. Receive this white garment and see thou carry it without stain before the judgment seat of our Lord Jesus Christ that thou mayest have eternal life. Receive this burning light and keep thy baptism blameless. Observe the commandments of God that when the Lord shall come to the nuptials, thou mayest meet him together with all the saints in the heavenly court and live forever and ever. Amen. Ada is now become Therese. But her dreams have gone deeper than that. And now for the first time she lays bare her real ambition. For Therese has supernatural yearnings. She wants to become a sister. Well, there is no reason why she shouldn't. But 
provided she really has a vocation. Of course, she will need her father's consent too. Therese confesses she has not discussed the matter with her father yet, though she does realize that she must. She has no doubt whatever about the course she is choosing. So back she comes to her father's compound. Her friends are delighted to see her again, especially her mother. But Therese is impatient to see her father. She knows it won't be easy to explain her plans to him, so the sooner the better. When the time comes, her courage almost fails her. No woman in this town has ever proposed such a thing before. Well, somebody's got to be the first. Nossu is horrified. Is this what learning book has done for her? Doesn't she realize women are supposed to marry? Well, she might as well know now that she has already promised to Osuala. Away, girl, and forget this nonsense. Osuala, a pagan. He has two wives already. How can she marry him? She's a Christian now. She sees now why Nwaso didn't want her to be baptized. But Nwaso is worried too. Osuala will pay a big price for a wife like Therese, who has been to school and learned book. The girl must be brought to her sense. She must forget these silly ideas. But Therese has made up her own mind on the matter. She must go away from here. She can easily get a job as a teacher elsewhere. But she has reckoned without her father. Noasu has foreseen this. For the first time, he realizes that his daughter is no longer dependent on him. This is a new type of woman, one he doesn't understand. But he is still the chief. She shall do his will. Her mother shall be responsible to him for Therese's conduct. Her mother and Clement. If she should disobey, so much the worse for them. Therese is desperate. No one here will help her, for the chief's word is law among his people. She must get to the convent. The sisters are the only people she can turn to now. In the little mission house, Sister Columba and Sister Patricia have been considering Therese's problem. Clement is first with the news. Therese's escape has been discovered. Sister Columba is used to dealing with difficult situations, but she dreads what he has to tell her, and she fears for Therese. Noasu is furious. He is threatening to kill Therese's mother if she doesn't return immediately. Sister Columba doubts if Nwasu would really carry out his threat, but she knows he might. For her mother's sake, Therese must return. Very well, she shall return. At first, Therese refuses to listen, but she must listen. She cannot let her mother take such a risk. But she needn't marry Osuala. She must go back to the compound, yes but she shall go as a teacher to the sister's school there. Then perhaps she will be able to save enough money to repay her father for what he will lose by her refusal to marry Osuala, and so by her freedom. As is the only course open to her, Therese reluctantly agrees. One day she has a visitor, Lucy. Lucy is now a trained nurse. She has come back to her town to work in Sister Patricia's clinic. Therese tells her of her own predicament. Her determination is unchanged. She is saving every penny she can to buy her freedom from Noasso.
sorry, Therese. It will come all right in the end. Plenty to occupy her at the clinic. This is dispensary day, and though it is still early morning, there is already a queue waiting for the doctor. With the doctor comes Lucy's old friend, John. All the outlying clinics are visited at regular intervals by one of the sister doctors from the Mission Hospital, who makes a thorough examination of all Sister Patricia's patients, including those patients who attend here for prenatal advice and treatment. Where medicines are acquired, they are prescribed and dispensed on the spot. John sets up his dispensary in an adjoining room and Lucy brings him the doctor's prescriptions for her patients. But all John's attention is not on his work today. Well, what's all this about? A present for you, Lucy. A present is almost a proposal of marriage. It's only polite to refuse it the first time. At the end of the day's work, they return to the mission center, the doctor, the dispenser, and the hospital cases. So she did accept it after all. Eventually, Therese finds she has saved enough money to pay off Noiseau. Now, she says, I have saved as much money as Osuela offered for me in marriage. You know I am a Christian. I cannot marry Osuela. I want you to take this money and let me join the sisters. You will not be at any loss on my account. Noasu is angry and confused. He cannot understand this daughter of his. He scolds, expostulates, but at last he relents. Therese shall be free. Her quiet tenacity has defeated Noasu and Noasu is honest enough to pay tribute to it. He doesn't want her money. This is something outside his experience, but it is something that has won his respect. A few weeks later, Therese enters the novitiate at Urella as a postulant, and in due course, she is received as a novice. exactly the same lines as that which marked the same dedication of their lives to God by the Irish sisters at Kilachandra. After the reception, the novices begin their period of spiritual formation. The religious life is fundamentally the same the world over, whether it be in Africa or Ireland. African church, strong and vigorous, fruitful in martyrs, and saints like the great Augustine. With its ruin and collapse under the onslaught of the Mohammedan armies, it seemed as if Christianity had been banished forever from the African continent. Yet, almost in our own day, it has been reborn, not in the Africa of Augustine, but farther south. Here in Nigeria, its growth has been miraculous and these African sisters are a symbol of its vigor and progress. At last, the day of profession arrives for Therese. Among the friends who have come to rejoice with her are Clement and Lucy. Sister Columba is here too, and as she sees her former pupil dedicate her life, she cannot but rejoice at what God has wrought through her in the heart of Sister Therese. Now that she has professed, 
Sister Therese can undertake the teaching career for which she is already qualified. And it is of this that Sister Columba now speaks. The need for sisters is still as urgent as ever. And there are still huge pagan communities for which no sisters can be spared. Sister Therese's people have had the gospel preached to them and know the road they must follow. It is for Sister Therese to consolidate the work which the Holy Rosary Sisters have begun. Their services are required elsewhere. So Therese will go back to her town to take over the direction of its school and its tiny convent. With her will go one of her companions, Sister Bernadette. Sister Therese soon learns the daily routine of our work here and shows herself quite capable of the task entrusted to her. The Holy Rosary sisters prepare to depart. Sister Columba gives her successor some final directions and advice. The car is already waiting. And Lucy, who will now take over the clinic, is here to see the sisters off. They are destined not to leave yet a while. Clement arrives here once more. Noasso, the chief, is dying. Noasso has been ailing a long time. But Clement's news shocks them. Is he sure? Yes. There can be no doubt, Noasso has not long to live. Perhaps even now it is too late. Noasso, the man who first admitted the sisters to this town, but never became a Christian himself. Has he said anything? Has he given any sign? Clement tells them that he has spoken of Therese. If Therese talks to him, he might change his mind. But they must hurry. Therese goes with Clement. Sister Patricia goes with them too give what help she can. Clement is right. Noasso has not much time left in this world. No medicine is going to save him now. But Therese is suddenly sure that Noasso will not die a pig. She sends Clement for the priest, while she herself tries to prepare her father for his last end. <laughs> of salvation to his people unto the remission of their sins, to enlighten them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to direct our feet into the way of peace. 
for the manner of Nossa's death. They must not be anxious for her. Their mission in this town is accomplished. But she knows that there are thousands of other towns in Africa that sit in darkness, waiting for the sisters to come. <laughs> 